Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second Under the Water live webinar titled Exploring the Flooded Caves of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, which has been made possible by grant support of the Honor Frost Foundation. My name is Mark B.T. Edwards from the Nautical Archaeology Society office in Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Sam Meacham from Sindac. Sam has been exploring the caves of Mexico for the past 25 years and has been involved in many expeditions, including the discovery and the exploration of Ox Belha, one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world. Uh, Sam and his colleagues are now using advanced technologies to discover and map out cave systems, as well as giving non-cave divers a chance to experience these amazing environments, which is what we're gonna see this evening. So Sam, if you wanna unmute yourself, it's over to you. Uh, good evening. I, I, I hope everybody can hear me. And um, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to the Nautical Archaeology Society for, for hosting this event. And to my friends, uh, Peter, Phil, and Dominique, who will join us later for a, a series of questions and answers um, and discussion on, on what I think is a pretty cool subject. And of course, I'm very biased. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to do tonight is give all of you an overview. I can't assume that everybody in the audience knows where we are and what we do here. So this is a kind of a general overview of where we are, what we do, how we do what we do, and uh, a little bit about uh, how we're conducting uh, underwater archaeology in uh, the flooded caves of this region. So uh, as, as part of this, uh, in the handouts, I, I sent Mark earlier uh, a, a Word document uh, that should be in the handout section there that you all can download. And what I've done is create a, a number of different links that if you have, uh, you want to kind of dig deeper into any of this, you can click on those links and see more information. So um, first of all, yeah, let me see. I'm going to get my, here we go. Um, what I represent is the Centro Investigador de Sistema Acuífero de Quintana Roo. Uh, we're a, a Mexican-based nonprofit, and our mission is to facilitate the research, and promote education, and support the conservation of the natural and cultural resources associated with the cenotes and underground rivers of, of Quintana Roo, Mexico. Uh, and uh, here, uh, I'm. I'm, I'm kind of new to social media, but we have a, a YouTube channel, uh, we've got an Instagram account, we've got a Facebook page, and we have a website. Uh, again, there are links to most all of these things uh, should you want to learn more about our organization and what we do. Um, we're very grateful for the tremendous amount of support that we get that allows us to be able to do this work. Um, so I always like to start off with a basic geography lesson uh, about where we are. And Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, perhaps many of you have been here, it's, it's an enormous um, uh, tourist destination. And we're on the, the southeast corner of Mexico. Uh, the peninsula kind of juts up into the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. And it's part of something called the Yucatan Platform, which is an enormous limestone platform that in its totality covers in the neighborhood of 250,000 square kilometers. Um, and I'm going to, I think you can see my mouse here moving around, but uh, basically the platform extends up into uh, the northern portion of the, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico here. And there are a couple things that you need to, to realize about this area that are important. Number one is that limestone, of course, is conducive to the formation of solution cave systems, and we have an abundance of that here. It's just one big piece of Swiss cheese. Uh, the second thing is that this coastal strip here between Cancun and the resort city of Tulum, which is about a 80 to 100 kilometers of beach, basically, uh, not to mention the island of Cozumel right here, uh, this small area accounts for about 10% of Mexico's gross domestic product through tourism and the tourist industry. And it's an absolutely amazing place. Uh, Mexico in general, I could give a full presentation about how wonderful Mexico is, uh, but the, this place just has so many incredible things uh, associated with it. 
that uh, when I first moved here in 1994, my plan was to be here for only six months. And uh, almost 30 years later, I'm still here. So that's kind of a testament as to uh, the power this place has over people. Um, so going back to those two important things, there's an abundance of cave systems and there's an abundance of development along this coast here. And that development can have a uh, pretty negative impact on the cave systems uh, themselves. And not only that, um, the water that flows through them. And that's another important issue to look at here is uh, if you ever needed a concrete example of global climate change, uh, this is one. And so going back up to the northern portion of the peninsula here, all of that would have been habitable land during the last ice age when water, uh, ocean water levels were about 100 meters lower than their present day level. So not unlike the North Sea, for those of you in England and the connection to Europe, that uh, would have been either ice or, or dry land, by my understanding, not unlike that at all. Um, and so the caves that we dive into today were actually dry during that point in time. And that plays a little bit into uh, what we're going to be talking about, the paleontological record of these cave systems in a minute. So a little bit about the natural and cultural history of this area. And uh, if we start over here on the left side, uh, as you may well know, uh, an enormous meteorite impacted what is today the Ukraine Peninsula uh, 65 million years ago and is, is pretty generally accepted now to have caused extinction of dinosaurs. Um, Pretty incredible cataclysmic event. The, the meteor, if, if you could have stopped it as it is in this, this illustration here, uh, at the millisecond that the leading edge was touching the planet, the outer edge, the trailing edge of it, would have been at the same altitude that a commercial jetliner flies today. So uh, just it's kind of hard to, uh, to wrap your head around just how cataclysmic that event might have been. Uh, but what's important to realize is that the Yucatan Peninsula, as we know it today, did not exist uh, 65 million years ago. And that impact happened. And in the 65 million subsequent years, the deposition of calcium carbonate produced the limestone platform that on average is about uh, 1,200 meters thick. Uh, so that the, the meteor impacts are buried under a, a tremendous amount of limestone, but indirectly, uh, the formation of these cave systems and the position of the cenotes, the crystal clear pools of water we dive into, uh, have an indirect relationship to the impact of the meteor. Uh, moving over here, and uh, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about this uh, as we get into the presentation, uh, we have evidence within the cave systems here of uh, uh, the Pleistocene, and we have uh, Pleistocene megafauna and fauna and human remains uh, that are helping us understand the peopling of the Americas and uh, what this place uh, would have looked like during the last ice age, which is pretty exciting. Of course, uh, we also have the ancient Maya civilization. Uh, this is one of uh, Dominic Rosola, one of our panelists today's areas of expertise. He's an expert on uh, the traditional use and, and, and uh, of, of cenotes by the ancient Maya. And uh, you can't go anywhere really on the peninsula without coming across some trace of them having been there. And they were incredible astronomers. Uh, they're one of uh, just a few uh, civilizations of the five ancient civilizations to have created their own written form of expression. Uh, they were incredible mathematicians. Uh, there's a number of things that they did that uh, are just uh, absolutely incredible. And, and their archeological sites scattered throughout Mesoamerica still stand testament of, of their impact on this site as well. And it's important to say also that the modern Maya, their descendants uh, still are here and still very much a part of what we do. And we, we go into rural Maya communities uh, quite frequently to do our work. And uh, so very much a part of, of our uh, everyday life here is, is uh, interacting with the, the Yucatec Maya of this area. In terms of the, the natural history of this area, uh, just 
about 500 meters away from where I sit right now is the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. It's the second longest barrier reef in the world. Uh, we have over 100 species of, of mammal uh, throughout the peninsula. You can see a jaguar sticking out through a mangrove forest here. Uh, we have 540 resident species of, of bird, 240 migrant species of bird that come through the peninsula each year. Uh, the peninsula itself is actually positioned um, between the near Arctic and the neotropic zones of, of the Western Hemisphere. And so it's it's always been and continues to be this incredible mixing of, of both migrant and uh, resident species of animals. Uh, there's 182 um, species of reptile and amphibian, and we have 1,500 uh, vascular plant species on the on the peninsula. And I'm just talking about the Yucatan Peninsula. This isn't just Mexico. This is just one geographic location here where we are. And on the far right here, you see a, a cave diver looking back at all of that stuff. And, and basically that's our life here, was we, uh, through the work that we do, have just gained this incredible perspective that allows us to travel through the natural and cultural history of this area. And I think after having told you all of this, you may understand that my, my plans to be here for six months uh, you might understand why 30 years I'm still here. It's just an intriguing place to be. Uh, and as you'll see, the flooded caves of this area really uh, are this incredible re re repository of, of both human and geologic history and natural history. And so it's, it's pretty hard to, once you've uh, seen all of this, to pull yourself away. So, uh, this number continually changes. I use as our baseline uh, information here, the Quintana Roo Spurological Survey, which has uh, for a number of years uh, been compiling records on, on kind of the status of exploration in this area. And so every time I give this presentation, it has to be updated. And as of this month, there's uh, 407 underwater caves and cave systems recorded along the Caribbean coastline of, of the Yucatan Peninsula. And it, I, this is astounding to me is we're almost uh, at a, a thousand miles of confirmed data of underwater cave passageway, which is uh, a substantial amount. And it's important to note also that our group, SINDAC, by no means are we the only people doing this research here. There's a number of people and groups that have been here for years uh, contributing to this uh, pile of information uh, and data on the cave systems. Um, and it's also important to note that there's also dry cave passageway here as well. So uh, what I thought I'd do today is just kind of take you all through the process of, of how we do what we do. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to find uh, the, the entrances into these cave systems. They're called cenote. Cenote is a derivation of a Yucatec Maya word, cenote, which means uh, sacred well. And the, the current kind of guesstimate is that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10,000 cenotes uh, across the expanse of the Yucatan Peninsula. So uh, it's more than several lifetimes of work uh, to try and figure out uh, all of them and explore all of them. And uh, there's no real way to generalize about cenotes. This is a cenote Esmeralda. It's part of the Oshvelha cave system down south in Tulum. I actually was there yesterday. Uh, we dove into it. It's an absolutely stunning cenote. It's about 100 meters across. Uh, but we have other cenotes that are literally wells on farms. And you go down a well, and it's a, you know, it's a shaft that you go down, and it opens up into a cave beneath. So it's Kind of hard to generalize about cenotes and what they look like and what their shape and characteristics are. Uh, what I would say they all have in common is the fact that they're these just absolutely beautiful crystal clear pools uh, in an otherwise very inhospitable uh, jungle environment. Uh, we, you know, we have all sorts of, it, it's kind of a thorny forest here. Uh, so walking around in it isn't that much fun, but if you have the kind of the the, the hope of discovering or coming across a cenote on that hike uh, and you can dive into it 
when you get there, uh, it kind of washes all that away. And it's just, uh, they're, they're absolutely beautiful uh, natural features to this area. So when we first started off, this is uh, the late Bill Phillips, who is a prolific explorer here. He and I did a lot of early exploration in the 1990s. And we basically didn't know anything when we first started off. And we would just literally park on the side of the road and hike off in the, the hopes that we would find us and on the entrance. And we quickly realized uh, that that was pretty uh, fruitless. And so what we started to do is compile information about, you know, what's, how can we preserve our uh, suffering or, or limit our suffering and have some certitude that when we hike off in the jungle, we're going to find something. So what we did at the beginning is we would take uh, topographical maps and aerial photographs, as you can see in the left slide or photo here. And this is in the early 90s, the GPS technology was emerging and getting better. And we could kind of plug theoretical points into a GPS and hike out to the jungle and uh, using the aerial photographs that have a lot more data uh, in them, we could we could see things that looked like some of these and then try to find them. And that worked pretty well. Uh, in the back of my mind, I was thinking it would be really nice to combine all of that into one unit. And as you can see here on the right side, that's a, a, a Trimble uh, uh, GPS unit that allowed us to do that. We bought those in 2005. But basically what you can do is you can upload the aerial images, uh, satellite data, topographic maps as base maps in that, and then you can see exactly where you are in relationship to what it is you're looking for. And so that technology, we continue to use uh, Trimble uh, navigation uh, units. Now we've just purchased a, a, what's called an R1, which is a receiver that's sub it's sub meters, about 50 centimeters uh, accurate. And it works with our smartphones and allows us to capture data and, and, and see where we are. Uh, these units are more like uh, three to six meter uh, accuracy. So this was kind of a, a cool technological advance. Um, and then we started to play around with the data sets themselves. And so my, I have a background. Uh, I went to the University of New Hampshire from uh, 2009 to 2012 and got a degree in natural resources with focus on geospatial science. So that's the study of planet Earth from outer space. And there's all sorts of fantastic satellite data uh, to play around with. And, and what I ended up using was Landsat 5, Chromatic Mapper, which you can see one complete tile here of this region. And um, the real power in, in this type of data is the spectral resolution, uh, the spatial resolution. The pixels are very, very coarse. It's 30 meters per pixel. So it's very good for, for broad landscapes. Um, and again, the real power is in the spectral resolution and it has seven uh, bands, uh, really six of which are, are useful, uh, the three visible and the three near infrared bands. And basically what we can do with the correct software is uh, manipulate and tease information out of that data. So what you're looking at here are four images of the exact same place uh, the upper left side here, this is an aerial photograph. And you can see some features here uh, that, you know, these dark spots look like they might be depressions or cenotes. And I can tell you for sure that these two here are definitely cenotes. Um, this is Landsat thematic mapper. And you can again see the coarseness of the pixels, how pixelated it is here. Uh, this is a true color. Uh, rendering of the same spot, but looking at this, you wouldn't really see the details of that one uh, of, of the Sonote entrances that I've actually been to, and I know that they are. Um, the bottom left here, this is a, uh, a, a, a color, false color composite, and it's showing the vegetation health, basically. And so the darker red it is, the more healthy the vegetation is. Uh, but even still, it's very hard to discern anything here. And so what we found is that by there's a, a specific band combination, uh, it's called the 5 over 4 ratio, that allows you to uh, measure uh, moisture content and vegetation. 
And so it wasn't hard to think that, well, if we took the, the satellite image from, from a very dry, dry season, we have very pronounced wet and dry seasons here, that uh, we would see uh, the cenotes sticking out much more pronounced than the surrounding vegetation because they have year-round access to water. And sure enough, uh, you can see these kind of green spots right here. Uh, you wouldn't see these in any of the other images that we're looking at, uh, but basically each single one of these we hiked out to and they turned out to be cenotes. So uh, what we try to do is take available technology, available information, and use it to our advantage. And so we can use this technique. Uh, we also have LIDAR data for this area. And so light, light detection and ranging is a laser sensor on the belly of an aircraft uh, that gives you a bare earth model. And it can show us uh, depressions, uh, which in this case would be cenotes. Uh, it can also so, show us where there's uh, hills, which here it's very flat, so hills sometimes mean pyramids uh, for uh, discovery of new archaeological sites. So what I was taught in graduate school to look for was a confluence of evidence. So if we have a depression with high moisture content and vegetation uh, from a satellite image, then we have a fairly high probability of finding something that's a small thing. Um, we're also using drones more and more these days. We have two of the Mavic Pro drones, which we bought to originally just to, you know, help us uh, get a periscope view above the jungle here uh, and to help us document some of these from up above. And so uh, this is really useful uh, technology. It's great technology. Uh, I still, every time we fly it, I can't believe that it actually does what it does, but uh, it, it, it's incredible. And for about two years now, we've been using uh, software called Drone Deploy, uh, which allows us to, uh, mm -hmm. in the upper left here, uh, create a flight plan, and we can determine the altitude and the direction of travel. And then uh, the, the telemetry of the flight gets loaded up into the drone. It goes off and automatically flies that route. And then Drone Deploy, the company that makes this software, uh, takes all of the data we create and creates uh, an orthorectified image uh, that we can have a very high resolution uh, snapshot of time at the surface, which is very important. And we can also, the bottom left here, this is an elevation at treetops. And the bottom right here, this is a, a sense of uh, vegetation plant health uh, using the RGB data. They now have, uh, DJI now has a, uh, made mostly for agriculture, but a, a, uh, a drone with near infrared sensors that we'd like to get our hands on at some point in time. Uh, so drones also are just helping us uh, keep track of what's happening at the surface and, and find cenotes as well. Uh, another way we find cenotes is from underwater. And this is my friend Mark and I surfacing in the cenote way out in the middle of the jungle with the GPS. And we uh, put the GPS into a light canister, uh, traversed from one cenote and came into this one. Uh, I got out of my gear, took the GPS out of the light canister, and we were able to get a fix as well. So uh, it's pretty cool when we find a cenote from underwater. Obviously, there's a lot. If we're coming into the downstream side of it, there's all the organic debris that starts, it's been washed in from millennial, millennium in there and so we can um, follow that trail of debris to uh, the entrance and the, of course the crystal clear water and the beautiful rays of light that come down make it quite a, a magical experience. Uh, and finally in terms of finding cenotes um, of course there's people that have lived here forever and they know the land better than we do and this is a, a cenote that we were shown last year uh, right when we came out of confinement from COVID here, and um, we still have to go back and, and dive it. We were shown this one uh, by a community, and, and uh, they have three other signal base now that they want to take us out to. And so human intelligence also is an extremely important factor in terms of, of, of helping us find this. So in a nutshell, that's how we get started with the process of, of diving in the signal base. Um, uh, and first, again, we have to find them. 
So exploring and mapping the caves, uh, as soon as we find one, that, a, a cenote entrance that looks promising, we'll free dive down into it. We usually always travel into the jungle with a mask and a submersible light to, to see what's going on. And what we're looking for is just a huge dark cavity going off into the distance. And then what we can do is start to plan the logistics of, of diving into it. And in terms of diving, we have all kinds of equipment and gear that we can choose from these days. And I was telling uh, Mark and Peter and Phil and Dominique at the beginning, I, I've never been more excited about what I do. And, and I think in large part that's because of the technology that we have above ground, but also underwater as well. And so we make uh, specific equipment choices for the specific environments that we go into. We can dive open circuit side mount, open circuit back mount. Uh, we have uh, passive semi-closed circuit uh, rebreathers uh, that are back mounted, that are side mounted. We have closed circuit rebreathers uh, that are back mounted. Uh, so we can kind of configure our uh, dive configuration to whatever it is the cave throws at us, right? Uh, we also have uh, DPVs, the dive propulsion vehicles that allow us to transit through the caves much more rapidly and we can cover a great deal of area. Uh, battery technology, light technology have just uh, gotten so much better. And we can do a dive with a light like we have here. Uh, the other day we did a six hour dive and you know we have one of those is our primary light, and then our, we actually have one as a backup light as well. But uh, those dive, you know, the lights last for six hours, and they're brighter than anything we had previously. So uh, the diving technology, we have a, a pretty uh, varied toolbox that we can reach into uh, to help us uh, dive into the cave. And as you can see here, there's just a couple pictures of that. It, it, it's there's it's quite a logistical undertaking. Uh, we can have a lot of gear with the, the uh, side mount uh, and, and the uh, back mounted uh, semi closed circuit rebreathers, which is what we use the most, really. Uh, that's helping reduce the amount of logistics. We have a lot less tanks that we need to have. We always have safety built in. Uh, but uh, we don't need as many tanks as we would if we were on open circuit. Um, so mapping the cave, and, and this is kind of starting to get into the idea of underwater cave archaeology, um, which is an emerging field, and this is something uh, that Phil and Dominique and Peter can and definitely uh, uh, add a lot to in our conversation. Uh, as opposed to nautical archaeology, underwater cave archaeology, uh, something that's really important that I've come to realize is that the cave is very much a part of the, the, the story of whatever it is that we find in there, whether it's from the ancient Maya civilization or whether it's from the last ice age, uh, because those things had to go through the cave in order to get to their final resting place. So. Uh, Making a map of the cave is extremely important to understand uh, the context of, of those things that we find within the cave. And so this is when we first started to explore, uh, we were doing jungle projects. We would move somewhere in the neighborhood of two tons of equipment by horseback out to these remote sites and we would hand draw our maps um, and we were doing knotted line survey. Uh, you can see here uh, in the bottom right corner, that's my old Mac laptop, uh, laptop here, uh, which is in pieces right beside me, by the way. It's going into a museum, I think, one day, if it can survive. Uh, but basically, we would print out the map on acetate and overlay it on an aerial photograph at the same scale to see where we were in relationship to the surroundings uh, at the surface. And Today, uh, what we're using, this is an innovation, it's something called the NEMO. It's developed by Sebastian Kister, who's in, in the blue shirt in the bottom right. Uh, he's a local cave diver here, and it's um, an incredible device that has a, an internal pressure sensor, a digital compass, and a, uh, a pretty ingenious way of measuring the line, which is a wheel that turns around 
passing light sensors to count distance. And uh, what this has done is just dramatically increased the accuracy of our survey and the uh, speed at which we can survey as well when we're underwater uh, doing the caves. And at the very least, when we explore a cave, we're coming out with a, a stick map of it. Um, and, it, and with more effort, we can do more volumetric type maps of the cave system with left to right and up and down uh, measurements to the, the wall, floor, ceiling. So Sebastian's device here, uh, the NEMO has really just revolutionized how we can explore the caves. And you can see on the bottom left here, there's a, a, a button here, this screws off and uh, rather than previously with not online survey, which is all done by hand, we had to type all the data in. Uh, we now have a USB port that port, uh, plugs into here and the data just goes right into his uh, survey mapping program, which is called Arion. So we're very excited to have this. And um, we started to resurvey the Yosbel Hot Cave system about a year and a half ago. And I have to check, but we're, we've done well over 150,000 meters of resurvey and new exploration in a year and a half uh, using the NEMO device. And uh, so we've definitely very good field testers for uh, Sebastian and his tools that he's created for the, the cave diving community. This is just kind of a result. And another thing uh, that we've done over the last year because of COVID and we were kind of confined to the office is we've uh, started really trying to, to manage all the data that we create. So we have a new uh, geographic information system we developed uh, through Weatherby Door Show, uh, a friend of mine uh, who is a GIS expert. And uh, what that's allowing us to do is really uh, visualize uh, on a team scale uh, all the data that we have and we can put in any archaeological site that we want into this uh, system as well and everybody on our team has access to it through their uh, smartphone or uh, smart pad or computer which is fantastic so uh, as i mentioned you know Almost every time we go diving, we see evidence of something paleontological or archaeological. Uh, and what I thought I'd focus on is, is uh, a discovery we made in 2017 uh, that we published a paper on last year, and that is a, a flooded ochre mine uh, very close to where I'm sitting right here. And um, just wanted to share with you some of the, the techniques and technology that we're using uh, to uh, to document that site. So um, this is uh, Dominique, uh, who is joining us for the conversation later, is uh, at the lab at the Cultural Heritage Engineering Initiative at the Paul Farm Institute, which is at the Jacob School of Engineering. Forgive me, Dominique, if I, I can't remember which, how the Russian dolls all fit together there. But uh, it's uh, an incredible facility. Uh, with helping artists, architects, and archaeologists digitize art, architecture, and archaeology. So um, I can't talk about anything that we've done in, in the flooded mine without going back and referencing the Oyo Negro project, which is an incredible project that Dominique's lab has been involved in helping out uh, for over 10 years now. And so really one of the principal uh, methods that we're using is photogrammetry and, and photogrammetry is nothing new and it's really nothing new to uh, underwater environments. It's growing in popularity and the ease by which people can use it. Um, but uh, for us in under uh, the, the flooded caves of this area, it's just an incredible opportunity to be able to take uh, the scientists that we work with to a place that they otherwise would have to go to. And so this is really where the, the strength of Dominique's lab is, is in uh, photogrammetric uh, uh, processing and visualization of data. So photogrammetry helps us with site documentation and helps us fill the baseline of the original state of the site. Uh, it allows access for non-diving scientists. It's, it's Tremendous aid for us in dive planning. 
uh, and in the recovery of objects. And of course, it's a powerful educational tool. Not only can we take the non doctor scientists, but we can take anybody in the general public uh, underwater with us uh, into these environments, finally. So um, we use a, a variety of different tools to collect photogrammetric data. Uh, ideally, we, we, within SINDAC, we use uh, Sony Alpha cameras. Uh, we have a Sony A7R, Sony A7S, and a Sony A7S III. Uh, and really, you know, the, these are great cameras in low light situations. Uh, they're relatively high resolution. Uh, so we can capture a lot of data, uh, which is really, really important. Uh, we use Nauticam housings. Uh, generally, I use a 16 to 35 millimeter lens, and we found that uh, the Keldan lights made in Switzerland are fantastic, uh, nice, even balanced light for uh, illuminating uh, what otherwise would be a completely dark environment. So the, the, the Sony Alpha 7, or the alpha cameras are fantastic. That's our kind of go-to camera setup for larger areas that we document. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. And then uh, over the last eight months, really, we've we've come across sites that are much more restricted and, and where it would be pretty much impossible to transport a camera to, or once we get there to, to, to fly the camera over a site for fear of, of doing damage to it because the ceiling to floor distance is so low. Uh, so we had an example of a mountain lion, a prehistoric mountain lion back in the cave. It was about 1,500 meters back into the cave. We had to pass through about three or four restrictions. And then when we got to where the, the mountain lion was, the ceiling to floor distance was about a meter. Uh, so we couldn't take the big camera, so we had to start improvising and in innovating. And what we came up with is what you see here on the left, or the right, excuse me, uh, a GoPro camera. Uh, and I'll show you an example in a minute of the results of it. But um, what this allows us to do with a monopod is extend the monopod and then with a, the GoPro on uh, 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 time, uh, I'm blanking, the, the, the capturing photos over time. We do one second uh, a photo every second uh, time capture. We, we can fly basically the, the, the camera over the site without impacting the site and uh, still create a pretty decent model. The trade-off, of course, is the, 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 the resolution of the, uh, the images and the GoPro obviously is very low image quality compared to the Sony cameras. Um, and here's, this is uh, Beto Nava, who directs all underwater operations in the Oyo Negro project with his uh, big mirrorless camera. Uh, and then that's me on the right with the GoPro camera, just showing you in, in two different environments, the setup. So the nice thing about the GoPro is that it's very easily transportable uh, and easy to set up. And we can uh, take uh, probably 600 photographs in the time-lapse uh, setting uh, very, very quickly. And uh, so it, it's, it's easy to deploy, uh, easy to teach people how to use, and inexpensive as well, which it compared to a larger format camera. So uh, just in terms of, of uh, the use of uh, the uh, Models, uh, this is just an incredible, uh, this is Oyo Negro project and the recovery of bone material. And you can see the Pelican case has been cut out uh, with the precise measurements of the bones that are being recovered. And that's all because of the, the, the model. And so you can isolate specific bones within the model, take very detailed measurements, and then the divers can go down with exact list of what needs to be recovered uh, where it is, and they can practice that dive in the model as well. So it's really good for, for dive planning, as I said. Um, this is uh, another incredible example from the Oyo Negro project. This is a reverse print of a uh, giant ground sloth pelvis uh, that was derived from the model. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the researchers at Dominique's lab here 
uh, with his team that developed this and just absolutely incredible. And uh, this is that ground sloth pelvis being recovered from the bottom. At the bottom of Oyo Negro, this was at about 55 meters of depth in Oyo Negro and uh, it fit perfectly into that cradle and came up uh, without a hitch uh, and is now being studied in Mexico City. So uh, the models really are just an incredible tool for a number of different applications. <clears throat> and of course, I'm sure those of you that are nautical archeologists can imagine how you could apply this on a uh, in maritime or nautical archeology span to the recovery project if you had to. Um, so in the case of, of the flooded mine that we found in 2017, uh, nothing really replaces a map. The map is is still, and this was done with Oyo Negro as well, uh, the basis by which we can, can show the context of a site. And as I mentioned, uh, without the map, it really, anything that you find here doesn't really take on much meaning. And so the, making a map is still an extremely important uh, aspect of what we do for underwater cave archaeology. Um, and this is a screen grab of just one of the models we created. And this is really the first place where we uh, saw that something was amiss. And you can see this whole edge here, and this is, mind you, all underwater and pretty far back into it, uh, the cave. Uh, this whole edge is broken off here and there's uh, the, the broken material has been piled up over here. And since we were the primary explorers of this, uh, we knew that this had to be old human interaction going on here. So uh, basically what we did is we took an exemplary area of, of cave passageway here, about three, uh, 250 meters of cave passageway. And what this is here is a fly through uh, of uh, the model. For this, uh, I, I think it was about 18 or 20,000 photos uh, that were taken using the Sony A7S. And then thanks to Dominique's lab, uh, taking the photos is the easy part. It's the uh, creating model and the computational power needed to do so uh, that is the hard part. But the incredible thing about this, again, is that we can take the general public, we can take the scientists that are interested in studying the site, and they can study it without causing any impact or us having to worry about them uh, going cave diving in a place they shouldn't be. So uh, these models are just absolutely incredible. Uh, you can see here some of the, the pits dug out by all of these pits here are just trenched by uh, early people. And basically, uh, Dominique will have to uh, double check my understanding here, but I think we're talking about 10,000 years ago and about 2,000 years of continuous activity within this one site. Um, another technology that we got to deploy in the mine was a, a Foxfish 360 camera. Uh, it just kind of fell into our laps, but we're very, very fortunate. And there's a link in that uh, handout to our YouTube channel. And we have a 360 video there that you can uh, look and you can dive into this with my, my colleague, Fred DeVos, and myself uh, going through the mine in 360. If you have VR goggles like the Oculus Go, uh, you can stream it on there and, and literally be with us as we die, which is pretty uh, fascinating as well. That's the, the 360 camera there. So um, I'm getting close to the end of my time here. Uh, this is all just kind of PR stuff and going to conferences and putting the VR goggles on people's heads and letting them experience the underwater caves here. It's, it's always amazing to, to give people that experience. Um, and I always have to kind of shine a light on the real treasure, which is in these caves, which is the water that flows through them. And the, the, the cave systems of this area are the conduits for fresh water and for our aquifer. And as you well know, you know, the majority of, of water on our planet is tied up in oceans of salt water and a very small percentage is available for human uh, consumption. 
And groundwater plays an incredibly important role. 22% uh, of the available water to us or fresh water is, is groundwater. 20% of the human population depends on groundwater. And um, we're of course very concerned about the conservation of these cave systems because of water and because of the natural and cultural resources uh, that are associated with them. Um, 1.1 billion people on the planet today live without access to clean drinking water. Uh, 2.6 billion people live without access to sanitation. 90% of the uh, human waste in the developing world is left untreated. 70% of industrial waste in the developing world is left untreated. 80% uh, of the diseases in the developing world are all waterborne. And as a result, 5 million people a year uh, die from those diseases. And so uh, clean drinking water is a, is a huge issue for all of us. And we have uh, the incredible ability here, as many people do around the world, to actually dive into the aquifer and show people what groundwater looks like. And it's through discoveries like the mine or Oyo Negro or uh, the Maya sites we have here uh, that we really can uh, draw people's attention in uh, to this environment and uh, then make them think about the importance of it. So um, the population in this area just is, is growing exponentially here. It just continues to grow uh, at a, an incredible clip all through tourist development. <clears throat> and I think that's you know one of our main concerns as we go forward is that the, the preservation of, uh, of the natural and cultural resources here. So um, we, uh, like I said, I've never been more excited about what we do. We've got an incredible amount of opportunities uh, still before us. Uh, it, it's an exciting time to be alive because of all the technology that we have. And I'm gonna uh, stop there. Uh, I've got, uh, of course, we have a lot of support from uh, not only all these uh, manufacturers of equipment, uh, we're very grateful to the uh, National Institute of Anthropology and History, Elena Barba, uh, Roberto Junco, and the Underwater Archaeology Subdivision are tremendously supportive of our work, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate them putting the amount of confidence uh, in us that they do and all the universities that we work with <clears throat> and all of the, 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 the private and uh, landowners that we work with, uh, public landowners that we work with and the people that contribute to our efforts. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, Mark, I've gone three minutes over 45 minutes, so I think I'm more or less on time. <clears throat> you are very I'm good. Need a glass of water, but uh, <laughs> So, and that's our Instagram. And again, I would just say that, that handout, if you can download that, that's going to give you uh, a, a lot of links to a lot of the things that I've talked about. And I'm, I would be more than happy to come back again and focus on any one subject that you guys are interested in. And thank you again, Mark, for putting this together. Really that's appreciate it. That's brilliant, Sam. Thank you so much. Before we introduce everybody else, Sam, I had a question. Okay with regards to the dating of the Lamina site? You're talking about sort of uh, 10,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago? Um, Correct. In terms of that human, that human uh, activity. How is, that, how is that date achieved? Charcoal. Uh, oh. So there's obviously for humans to go into that environment, they needed to have uh, light. And so what's, and Dominique can really speak a lot more uh, intelligently in all of this than I can. But basically, uh, we do find charcoal in all of the cave systems here. Um, but you can't always assume that it was brought in by humans. And so one of the cool things about the, the mine project was that the charcoal samples were uh, analyzed by Dr. Barry Ropp at, at the University of New Hampshire, who's a wood anatomist. And he put them the samples in a scanning electron microscope and could identify the species of, of wood down to uh, you know each species and they have names like torchwood and candlewood, uh, copal is another one, uh, very high resinous woods that would have been advantageous for fires right and they did a comparison of the, the 
charcoal samples out of Boyo Negro, which is much closer to an entrance than the mine site is. And whereas Boyo Negro had more of a sampling of everything that grows in the forest, uh, the, the, the type of wood found in uh, the charcoal samples in the mine pointed to direct human having taken them in there because of the high resonance quality of the, of the wood itself. So uh, it, pretty it cool. makes sense. It makes sense when you when you describe it. Of course, the, you know you need lights, don't you, in there? Um, yes. It's going to be pitch yeah. black otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we let's uh, put the webcams on? Let's uh, stop showing the screen, uh, and uh, we shall uh, bring up the other discussants who are joining us this evening, or at least it's evening here in the UK. Uh, it's not where Sam and Dominique are. So, uh, Dominique, why don't you just uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, uh, my name is Dominique Rosello. I'm an archaeologist and assistant research scientist here at the Qualcomm Institute at University of California, San Diego. We're the Cultural Heritage Engineering Initiative. And so we bring student-driven innovation and a passion for cultural heritage um, uh, to our School of Engineering. And uh, our focus is on the documentation and visual of cultural heritage sites with a with a focus on on underwater cultural heritage. Brilliant, thank you. And Peter, how about you? Hello, I'm Peter Campbell. I'm a lecturer in cultural heritage under threat at Cranfield University, and um, I kind of wear many maritime hats. But um, I, I work in underwater caves um, in the Mediterranean region, and uh, and edited the book. Um, the Archaeology of Underwater Caves. Thank you. And then many NES members will know the other chap, Phil. Hello, Phil. Good evening. Um, thank you for the invite to be involved. Um, my uh, Professionally, I'm Diving Safety Officer and Diving Operations Manager for Lund University in Sweden um, on archaeological projects, which in the last five years have been um, varied from shipwrecks from 1495, a Danish king ship, right through to Second World War aircraft but my passion is caves. Um, I started life as a dry caver, learned to dive only so I could dive the flooded sections of dry caves and that progressed on to um, similar types of cave diving to Sam is undertaking here, but for me mostly in, in active river caves. Um, so the combination of the two things, the archeology span and cave is just fascinating. I'd just like to say fantastic talk, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Bob. So, so Phil, you were saying uh, when we were having our little private chat before we started about the Nemo, because I'm fascinated by this Nemo. Um, you've just taken one, but you've not used it in anger yet. And Sam's been using his for a little while now. Oh, he's got there it in it his is. hand. I got one right there. here. Never leave one without it. It's an so amazing bit of kit. I, I've literally got mine um, about four months ago, and I'll be us using it extensively uh, both in a local lake um, when I've been allowed to within the restrictions we've got in the UK at the moment. But I've got about 20 dives on it, laying out simulated cave line in the lake to, to test it and learn it, um, and then use it with the software that it works with, Ariane's line. And I've also been lucky enough to take it into Wookie Hole Cave and actually use it to uh, remap mapped cave to compare my results to, to the known maps. And it is a phenomenal tool. And I think, um, something that Peter was saying before the talk came on, we are living in such exciting times where we've got such amazing technologies from drones to LIDAR to NEMO, uh, rebreathers and all of this stuff that's starting to come together to give us the ability to do something that we've never been able to do before and that is show our passion, our environment to, to the general public because you can't take them there. So it's just incredible times. Because of course, in in any sort of underwater endeavour, that's what we're doing. But for for me, I'm a diver. But the idea of doing what you guys are doing in the caves, like no, thank you very much. I'm quite happy with having a route to the surface. Um, but is the Nemo replacing the tape measure and the compass and the drafting, you know, writing it down at the same time? It's it's recording for you all of those things digitally that, that you can then download it and in, input it into the software. Sam? Um, well, uh, I would say that you always should have the backup knowledge of how to do not blind survey. Uh, and uh, I always travel with a compass and I've got my, yeah, 
we've ceased using knotted line here, so we've, we've kind of gone off a cliff there. Uh, so we'd have to actually start measuring with a, a measuring tape if we had to go back or with a, a fixed length of string. But um, the Nemo is, I, I think, definitely taking us down a whole new road in terms of uh, the technology. We just, to give you an example of the accuracy, when we, when, for us to measure accuracy in our tape survey, it's loop closure. And so you start at one point and come all the way back around to that same point. Uh, how far off is it? And we just, we, in our resurvey efforts here, we have a loop that was actually 5,500 meters in totality, and the loop closure was less than 1% using NEMO, which I don't think anybody could replicate using the knotted line survey. And the other advantage to it is that the, the LCD screen here uh, is, has different colors that indicate what it's doing. And so we dive in a lot of low visibility situations here where literally I have to put it up to my face mask to, to see what it's doing. But we're able to get data in areas that otherwise we wouldn't ever be able to do that with not a line survey. I wouldn't be able to see a compass. I wouldn't be able to see my, my depth gauge. Uh, and so we're, we're getting very accurate data in the most adverse conditions that uh, get thrown at us, which is fantastic. Because of course we we don't see those poor visibility bits. We just see the photographs where it looks beautiful and it looks crystal clear and the the light trickling in from above. But but yeah, I, I suppose you're... like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peter, question? Yeah, it, it, well, more of a comment um, as I am wont to do. But I just I just, I think this is this is so typical of cave diving. Uh, if you look at it from a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. The cavers are crazy and and love technology and love trying new methods and being innovative and if you look back on the history of underwater archaeology in fact cave diving and cave archaeology was far more prevalent than shipwreck archaeology until the aqualung and you actually had a whole bunch of crazy cave divers going in inventing new methods the wetsuit was invented for cave diving and only later when uh, american marketers got a hold of it did they say that it was invented by americans in california uh you know the cave divers really were at the cutting edge of maritime archaeology in the first few years and then as shipwrecks rose in, in prevalence then you know there's been kind of a decline and a lull between in the 80s and 90s but now it's kind of roaring back and i think some of these projects that um the three other gentlemen here are doing are really at the cutting edge of maritime archaeology today and a lot of what we're talking about in terms of shipwrecks and sunken cities and paleo landscapes we're talking about DNA from underwater, but this is stuff that they've already done, you know, with Hoyo Negro collecting DNA from underwater sites for, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 years ago now or, or five years ago. How long has it been, Dominique? So, I mean, cave diving really has been at the forefront from the beginning. And I think with all of these new tools, you're seeing just some really exciting things coming out that's going to impact the whole field of maritime archaeology. Yeah, and you know, Peter, to kind of build on that, it's interesting that George Bass, familiar to all of us, uh, once said that it's better to teach the archaeologist to dive than to than for the diver to become an archaeologist. And you know, what we're talking about here with underwater archaeological sites in caves, it kind of turns that on its head, right? So you know, there's a big difference between you know some of us diving a shipwreck on a on a shallow sheltered reef. In Bermuda, it's not going to be all that different than a shallow sheltered reef in the Bahamas. But all of these caves are, they're like each unique organisms. And the people who have the experience and expertise to function um, at a very high capacity and with, with, with great effectiveness in these environments are the underwater cave explorers who are exploring and surveying these caves. So rather than have, you know, an egghead archaeologist like me try to <laughs> try to get up the speed on what's necessary to, to perform um, at a certain level inside these caves, you know, we need to be working with the underwater cave exploration and survey community. And you know, NAS has really gone a long way towards enabling highly skilled divers to become underwater archaeological technicians. And that's what we're really talking about here: is is really everyone being, bringing their their best, what they do best, to the process of documenting 
these sites. And you know, it's it's a really beautiful thing to see happen um, in places like Quintana Roo. Uh, you know, with and it just to me, it's always interesting to think about um, about you know how we're able to do what we do, and it involves a really uh, you know people with different experiences and expertise. Everyone has to be on their A game, absolutely. You know, efficiency in time, uh, savings in the documentation, and obviously with regards to the safety side of things. Very much. When, so. when you're in, when you're in the in the forest or the mangroves or whatever, how far away have you got emergency services? I mean, it, from the aerial photographs, it looks like you know you get into trouble. You're you know you're in trouble. Yeah, actually, I just bought a garment one of the little Iridium satellite communicator things uh, that has an SOS button on it. I'm not entirely sure who they're going to call. <laughs> uh, basically, we're, we, we're, we, we have to self-rescue in any situation we get into, and, and knock on wood, we've never had to, to do that. Uh, but I think, I, 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 and Phil can maybe back me up on this, that that redundancy in all of our systems, not only underwater, but at the surface are essential to what we do. And so we're, we're extremely careful. And uh, we, we, cave diving is all about risk management. I don't think there's a better uh, case study of applied risk management than cave diving. Uh, and whereas a lot of people think we're maybe adrenaline junkies, uh, that's very far from the truth. We're very deliberate, very careful. Um, my wedding band here is the assurance that I came home every day uh, from what I do. But we repeatedly do dives in, you know, they're, they're very complex environments that we uh, dive into here. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to become disoriented, uh, very easy to become kind of task loaded and forget uh, all of the decompression obligations, gas management obligations battery up with you know all the things that we have to kind of cycle through in one dive um and so as dominique says you know we have a, going on 30 years of experience in this environment and we're now very comfortable in it but we're never complacent okay we have a question from the audience which is are you able to expand any on the conservation and documentation of any artifacts found on these sites how does the water impact their stability? Because it's fresh water, presumably. Well, it's fresh and salt, and I'm okay. going to def defer to Dominique on this. He's well, well, certainly for uh, for human remains and and for the bones of of the, the fauna that we find inside the caves, there tends to be better preservation um, below the halocline in salt water, where we have um, low dissolved oxygen, the kinds of conditions that help preserve the bone, at least in terms of its structural integrity. You know, we all often run, um, well, the real challenge is, is uh, trying to extract um, a DNA and a viable sample for radiocarbon because of these environmental conditions. But certainly the preservation in, in, in some of the deeper portions of the cave, um, given the low dissolved oxygen, um, you know, tends to be very good. So, I mean, as Sam knows, I mean, we've got not just charcoal, but there's wood there's huge pieces of wood that are that are over 10,000 years old in, in these caves. Um, and uh, also, you know, the, um, you know, seeds and endocarps and other bits of plants that were brought in by bats. I mean, we see them laying, you know, at the bottom of these pits as if they were deposited, you know, last week. The preservation is quite excellent. And then I should also quickly mention, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, Sam can provide more detail on this, but um, the caves and the cave systems, underwater cave systems in Quintana Roo tend to be very low flow. And so um, we see a kind of a stasis in some sections of cave quite deep um, where there really has not been much movement since the caves flooded. I mean, there's very little deposition of sediment or accretion of sediment in certain sections of the cave for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, some of these deposits like the bones of extinct megafauna are just sitting on the floor of the cave, um, essentially undisturbed. So it, it's it, the preservation is, is quite interesting. That, that also means presumably the actual flooding of the cave took place very slowly in terms of low flow. It wasn't an influx of water that sort of broke through and down into the cave system to wash things 
away yeah. actually it, it's, it's it's come up yep it's just come up and up and up as the as the water table's risen yep wow. okay that's why things aren't washing away so i have a question for sam um mm -hmm. it's amazing you're finding all these new caves and and kind of in remote locations um do you get a sense of are there artifacts found in these remote caves as well or are the artifacts clustered uh, or more concentrated in near settlement sites? Um, are, is every cenote sacred and uh, the source of offerings, or is it uh, more kind of the settlement sites that you see things? Well, again, I would defer to Dominique, but I'll tell you what I think Dominique would say is that there, there's both a, a ritual use of cenotes, and then there's a daily use of cenotes for as a play, you know, there's the word cenot, which means sacred well, and the word chen, which means well. And so the chen's cenotes are more where people would go to collect water, and the cenot cenotes are more those that had more of a, a ritual sacred significance. And so we definitely found sacred cenotes with burial sites and, and you know, incense burners and human remains. And, sacrificial sites, I think Chichen Itza being probably one of the most famous examples of that. Um, so in terms of Maya archaeology, uh, I think you're going to have a higher probability of finding a ritual site nearer a settlement. But we find, you know, out in the middle of the jungle, ostensibly in the middle of nowhere, it's not uncommon to find a, a water collection pod that's just, you know, Maya, ancient Maya were clumsy people too occasionally and might have just tripped and dropped the pot into the cenote. So uh, I don't know, Dominique, did I get that right? No, I think you characterized it well. I mean, certainly there are pilgrimage caves and there are caves that are closer to to communities and, and the artifact or assemblage sometimes bears that out. You know, we see different patterns of cave use depending on where they are across the sacred landscape. But it's a real challenge in Quintana Roo, particularly where you know Sam lives and works. Um, you're seeing a, a very sort of you know balkanized landscape as a result of the spread of mainstream industrial tourism. You know, <laughs> you've got the the ancient cultural geography is very difficult to perceive and piece back together because it's covered with golf courses and all inclusive resorts and shopping malls and all manner of tourism offering and so that's just a real challenge for the archaeologist to look at this as a as an ancient landscape right not just on a site-by-site -site basis and that's really the importance of what scene doc is doing this is not about each site being kind of a one-off this is taking a larger longer term programmatic approach to systematically documenting these sites in a way that allow us to understand these cultural and natural systems and how they all fit together. So it's a it's it's a part of a much bigger vision, and you know it's something that I'm really excited to be a part of with Sam in, in Mexico. We we have a question with regards to the DNA in terms of what percentage of bones return uh, uh, found actually returned uh, DNA. I mean, do they all does it survive in every single one, or is it actually a, a rarity? <laughs> Oh my goodness, we're just we're just getting started. We only um, we only sampled uh, one individual Naya from Oyo Negro, um, uh, and three different labs confirmed that she we had her mitochondrial DNA was subhaplet group D1. So we did have a result, and uh, the autosomal work is proceeding um, with David Reich's lab at Harvard. So we should be able to pr proceed with whole genome sequencing provided. We're able to do so. These are highly degraded samples. There's always the potential for contamination. Um, so it's really kind of in its infancy. I would say that you know each and every one of the the human remain the bones that come out of of, of these cenotes is it's a long shot. Um, but uh, it's a tough. And so there's also a whole frontier for for the megafauna as well. You know, should someone really want to. Um, to, to you know, to spin up a study, um, an ancient DNA study around around these fauna. So it's just really still in its infancy, but there's there's some promise, and and you know, Naya yielded a result that that is interesting to us as archaeologists. Sam, the um, the, when you find a particular area of artifacts, especially remains, and especially if they're human, 
Um, what process do you go through to determine if and when to remove them for analysis scientifically outside of the environment? And how do you uh, do your best to preserve context of where they were before they were removed? So what's the choice on that? Yeah, so uh, everything we do, as I mentioned earlier, is is under the auspices of the, the subdirection of underwater archaeology. So our team uh, is given the mandate to be able to go in and document non-invasive, not touch anything, not move anything. We're very, uh, very much aware of, of why uh, context is so important. And so uh, the exciting thing is, is that we can go in, we can document an entire site, whether it's with high resolution video, photos, photogrammetry, potentially in the future with 360 video. Uh, and before anything is touched, we can then hand all of that information along with a map to the scientist and say, here is what is there. And then the scientist then will make the determination as to whether something should be removed. And some things are so important that they need to be removed in order to be studied. Uh, some things are uh, need to be removed because unscrupulous divers are potentially going to move them, and so they need to be protected. Uh, so really, we are the the AUVs of the scientific community, and and our first task is to document as as completely as we can a site and then turn that the, the information over to the experts and then have them say yes go back or no need to go back there at all well yeah. sam i would say you're smarter than the AUVs because really one of the most exciting things of working with the cave exploration community is they see things that we don't see they make connections that we don't make right so it isn't as if you know here's the data and the scientist is going to interpret it it's really a collaborative process right because they're we, there's so many other variables and factors and, and certain aspects of the context that um, that are sort of less visceral to us for not having been there or maybe less familiar to us as not really knowing those places. And so it's this incredible conversation that um, that relies on all parties to to uh, to arrive at at, um, at an interpretation of, of what we're looking at. So these decisions are very much made together. But I, I was going to have Sam elaborate on one thing though because I think this is. What I love about all of this is that this is still fundamentally about human exploration, right? You really can't send robotic systems into these types of places, right? This is not where you drop in an AUV or an ROV. This is these are this is these are humans who are exploring, and not just for practical reasons, but there's it it, it really kind of speaks to what the you know finding that balance between how technology can be an enabler. And how sometimes technology gets in the way, and so this is not throw everything you have at a problem. This is really thoughtfully kind of going through this whole process of what we're going to bring into these environments. Maybe Sam, you can talk a little bit about that as sort of being a human in these places. I, I think that's what I think is so interesting. Yeah, I mean we're we are continually diving and exploring these caves. Uh, we try to get in three to four times a week, and. Uh, I, you know, I think for me, the motivation, what's exciting is not necessarily what we've already found, it's what we still haven't found. And I think it's, it, you know, almost 55 years old, it still keeps my childlike imagination and curiosity very much alive uh, to yeah. want to keep going and see what's at the end of that line. And so, yeah, there's, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a challenging environment to work at it in, uh, but it's also extremely rewarding. And uh, I think it, it, it's exploration with a purpose. Uh, I, I like that about what we do. We're not just planting a flag and, you know, feeding our chest and then flying back home. We live here, we're part of these communities uh, and there's a real, uh, an incredible amount of scientific import uh, to what we're observing and, and documenting within these caves, apart from the kind of the, the dazzling uh, archaeology and paleontology. There's hydrologic and paleoclimate and geologic and biological. I mean, it's just uh, any scientific discipline can uh, be found within these caves, and that's exciting. I love the, the connection between the exploring that you're doing 
and the exploring that the person 10, 12,000 years ago would have been doing as well, because they would have been going in under, yes, fire torch lights, but they would have been having to ex memorize where they were going or leaving trails so that they knew which way to go back out again mm. in the same way that you're doing. It's just, the only difference now is that the technology allows you to do it in an underwater environment, which they obviously would have been able to do. Oh, and let's not forget that we don't have saber-toothed cats or, <laughs> or short-faced bears uh, lurking around the corners of that cave either. And and you're absolutely right, Mark. It's it's uh, you know I had to take eighteen to twenty thousand photographs in the mine to make that model, and so I spent a lot of time down there. And it, you know I'm fairly focused on what I'm doing, but in the back of your mind, you're just humbled by the amount of effort that those ancient people put into uh, doing the activity that they had to do. And it, it, I think one of the really fascinating things to come out of that study is that prior to that, my kind of vision of a, a prehistoric person was as a simple person. And we actually asked Jim Chatters once, who's one of the lead paleontologists, were they any different from us? And he said, no, they're absolutely the same, except they were a lot smarter than me. And they had to live by their wits. I mean, they, they had, you know, that a scratch could have been fatal from an infection. And and those people, the amount of social sophistication for them to continually go back to that one site for 2,000 years, right, Dominique, of continuing activity. So there's, a, there's communication across generations of people about the importance of that site. And people are taking wood down in there build fires to tend those fires while other people are literally breaking through, you know, a floor of a cave that's that thick with speleothems to then extract ochre and then carry it back out. Uh, it's just phenomenal. And so you're there in that environment seeing their footprint, if you will. And you, you, you know, I'm lucky. I get to go home to an air conditioned house and a nice home cooked meal every day. And the life that, that you know is the same planet but a completely different world that they lived in so um it's a very humbling experience indeed we have uh, a question with regards to any kind of threats from touristic cave divers damaging disturbing sites do you s experience that or not unfortunately yes we do and there's um there's a, a huge industry around cave diving here it's, it's becoming much much more mainstream and and rightly so it's an incredible environment for people to to visit and to interact with here uh, and there's cave diving all over the planet i mean phil's been all over the place cave diving and uh i think it's something i, I think what people fail to recognize is the importance of, of the site preservation and and uh, that you know, to go visit Chichen Itza, for example, uh, you know, it was named one of the, the seven modern wonders of the world. And it's one of the most visited archeological sites in Mexico, if not the planet. And it's become so uh, over visited that they had to put a restriction on people going up to the top of the pyramid anymore. And so there's a little thin line that just is there to prevent people from going up the pyramid. And in the case of Hoyo Negro, we have signs leading in the passageways to prevent people, you know, to tell them this is a restricted area, you shouldn't go there, uh, but they still do. And it's just, it's unfortunate. And, and uh, of course, even the best intention diver with the most incredible skills can still knock with the bubbles going up on the ceiling, a spelio them down on top of everything and, and impact the site. And so, uh, I know Dominique and I have spoken at length about this, and I think that's really one of the challenges we face is how do you balance people's desire to go and see these incredible places with preserving them? And I, I think we're still trying to figure that out. You have I the same experience, Peter? Yeah. Well, Phil, Phil, yeah, what about you? I think education has been a big part. So if you look at how cave diver training has evolved over the last 30 years, from you know um, our great mentor Sheck Exley's blueprint for survival of like well hang on people diving in caves isn't going so well what do we do about it well we'll evolve the training 
And over the recent times, like the last 10 years, that's gone to a whole other level of really concentrating on buoyancy, trim, propulsion, streamlining of equipment. So the diver can go and see these things without causing damage. And if you then add that to scientific institutions, no disrespect to Dominique or any other institution, not being quite so closed and maybe even a little bit arrogant as they were many decades ago and in actually involving the lay person. So things like the NAS, the NAS have gone, well, hang on, if we train the average diver to use the right techniques, they're not only seeing it, they're protecting it and they're sharing it. So much like all the equipment we're using, to do all this surveying and data acquisition is evolving. I think the way we're sharing it with the masses is evolving as well. And if we keep educating, it's why I think for me, it's one of the best ways to preserve. If you tell people, no, you can't go in there. People mm. for, for, forever have done sneak dives, places they shouldn't dive. Whereas if you let them in under some sort of controlled system and train them, I think that's a, that's a way forward. Yeah, I think also including a bit about the UNESCO World uh, uh, Convention on Underwater Cultural Heritage in the training curriculum would also make people realize why sometimes, you know, it's better they don't go to a place because uh, it can really, we've seen the impact here, unfortunately, on some sites that are forever damaged. Well, can I ask uh, Sam and Phil, um, I'm sure that there's people in the audience who would like to try cave diving? And uh, I mean, where can they get training, good quality training? Where can they do a, a try dive? Uh, where can they you know, go check somewhere safely? Um, what do you two recommend as far as people who like to try cave, cave diving? You can't really beat where Sam is. I mean, <laughs> you've got you from, from cavern through intro to full cave in, you know, comparing to the rest of the world, in, in no way am I saying that the environment Sam's in is easy. It isn't, especially what Sam's doing, but to learn with between the water temperature, the clarity, the quality of line laying, and you know, the 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 setup, it's it's an incredible place for your first taster for sure. And I think an awful lot of people who are very experienced technical open water divers have had their first taste of cave in the Yucatan and then taken it further. Um, Florida is a, a similar type environment, but you often have depth and high flow there. And the European caves are amazing, but you have cold water and flow. So I think uh, I think Mexico is, is probably really high up on the list of where to go for a taster. Yeah, no, I, well, I mean, who am I to argue? uh yeah it's beautiful here um and i think uh i represent uh global underwater explorers a training agency fills with impd and i think both organizations strongly stress uh a, a good foundation and skills and there's no sport that you learn whether it's football or cricket or rugby where you don't learn basic skills for all of those sports and i think unfortunately a lot of the kind of major uh, training agencies have just kind of gone past that and, and are just trying to get people through the door. And so I think with a lot of the training agencies, if you are interested in, in, in pursuing uh, 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 cave diving, uh, you really want to focus on your skills. And, and, and uh, as Phil mentioned earlier, buoyancy control, stable, uh, stability, uh, propulsion techniques, all of these things are, are taught in a GE funda uh, fundamentals class or a foundational class at IMTD. And uh, they're absolutely essential to being able to operate uh, safely and also enjoy the environment uh, that we're in. And it is really just one of the most surreal and sublime places you could imagine going to. For most people, it's their worst nightmare. but but. Uh, under the, the right circumstances and with good training and the right equipment, uh, it, it really is an incredible place to be. Okay, Sam, I think we're going to leave it there in terms of our time, if that's okay, folks. Thank you so much for, for that, uh, for your presentation, of course, Sam, and to uh, Dominique and to Peter and to Phil.
for joining us. So on behalf of all the speakers, all of our discussions from us at the NES and our sponsors, the Honor Frost Foundation, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>